And for today's session, I would like to hand over to Pippa, who is the Education Manager for the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust. Um, thank you so much for joining us and handing over. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'll just start sharing my screen with you all. Okay, awesome. So you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, Beck. I am Pippa. I work for the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust. We are a marine conservation charity based on the west coast of Scotland. And today I'm going to be talking about what we can learn from community sightings, um, which we collect through our whale track app and website. Uh, so that's what we'll be covering. So just to start off with who we are, uh, we're a marine conservation charity and we are based in Tobermory, um, so on the Isle of Mull. We cover the whole of the west coast of Scotland and we recently celebrated our 27th anniversary. Uh, our aim is to really make sure that whales, dolphins and porpoises are protected and valued throughout the Hebrides. And we do all of this by working with communities. So citizen science uh, is really at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we've been collecting data and records from the public since 1990. Um, and it really underpins a lot of the research and the work that then informs the conservation and kind of protection of these species here in Scotland. So, what I'll be talking to you about is the data collected through whale track. And although we have been recording sightings since 1990, a lot of what I'll talk about today is actually since we launched our app, Whale Track. Now, we basically upgraded our infrastructure in 2017 um, and so created an app to try and make it as easy as possible for people to record their sightings of whales, dolphins and porpoises, but also other animals like basking sharks, turtles uh, uh, and other species. Uh, so it was it was designed to also make records kind of standardised and allow people to collect more and higher quality data as well. Um, if you don't have a smartphone, you can use uh, the website too. So there's a website where you can interact with the data and record sightings. And actually this is specifically for the west coast of Scotland. Uh, so kind of before we get started, we have got a couple of polls just to, so I can see where people are from. Uh, so Beck, could you possibly launch those? Great. Uh, so it'd be great to know whereabouts you're joining from today. Um, so if you want to fill that out. Excellent. OK, so we've got quite a lot of people from England and uh, kind of 22 percent at the moment sitting from Scotland and 4 percent from Wales. So, yeah, this is this app is is specifically for the west coast of Scotland, but there have been other apps um, subsequently launched that cover other areas. So um, basically, most of what I'll talk about today is relevant wherever you're based. Um, so thank you very much for that. And then the second polling, actually, it would be, I'm quite interested to know how many people already take part in uh, citizen science um, in, in terms of the marine environment. So, um, awesome. Great, okay, so results are coming in, that's good. Almost everybody's voted and we're around 80, 83% of people are. So fantastic. And if you're not um, and, and you kind of get inspired today, that would be awesome. Um, so yeah, what we'll be talking about is really how this type of data can have a big impact. Uh, in terms of the data that we've collected since the, lo the launch of the app in 2017, actually there are over 2,000 users uh, using WellTrack. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's an amazing effort of people putting in the time to go out and watch. There are over 14,500 sightings of marine animals. And actually, if you count the number of animals within each of those sightings, that's over 87,500. Um, so it really is a staggering public effort um, and is really aiding our understanding of animals on the west coast of Scotland. Okay, so 
today we're going to be talking about what we've learned and like I said a lot of this is relevant to marine citizen science right across across the UK um, so we'll be talking about what we can learn in terms of time place biodiversity population behavior and also the health of animals so we're going to start with time and actually community sightings allow us to learn about animals all year round here you can see uh, the sightings that have come in through whale track since 2017 broken down in months of the year and actually there is a really noticeable difference between the different months so we're getting huge amounts of data in the summertime um, and numbers of sightings are much lower during kind of the winter months so this is really important because actually in the winter time especially every single sighting actually has a really big impact um, so if you're out and about and you're walking along the coastline or you're on a ferry and you happen to see an animal in the winter please please do record it just like you would in the summertime um, it is there are many animals that we have in our waters around the UK all year round. Uh, so in Scotland, these are some of the resident species that can be found, ranging from the smallest, which is the harbour porpoises that you can see here in the photograph, right the way up to kind of the large humpback whales that are pretty showy and like quite hard to hard to miss when they're around with their huge blows and sometimes showing their tails. Uh, so we've got a real mixture. But in terms of these animals, trying to learn about things like our harbour porpoise that are actually quite small does require a lot of uh, a lot of data and a lot of input. So winter sightings in particular teach us so much about them. Then there are also the migratory species. So animals that are coming during the summertime when the waters are warmer and they're coming here predominantly to feed, although we also have other important behaviours seen, which we'll talk about in a bit. So on the screen, this is a common dolphin. They've got beautiful hourglass kind of yellow colouring down the side and they're typically thought of as a summer visitor. However, community sightings actually show that common dolphins don't always follow what the textbooks say. And actually, thanks to individuals reporting up in kind of the west, uh, sorry, the northwest of Scotland, uh, there have been records of these animals all throughout the year, which is quite surprising. Um, now, in terms of the numbers, that's not lots of common dolphins staying, but there are individual differences within species. And so we can start to kind of work out why smaller groups may be staying and, and kind of hanging around longer than we would have maybe anticipated. These seasonal differences, uh, it's, it's important to recognize that they are influenced by a number of factors. Uh, so of course we do have more animals in the summertime as we have the migratory species arrive, but that's not all and that's not the whole picture. There are also going to be more people out watching and also recording during the summertime and actually a huge number of the sightings that come in to us are recorded by boat operators taking people out on whale watching or wildlife trips so we're incredibly grateful uh, for all of those businesses that are helping to kind of contribute the other thing is that in the summertime the water is generally calmer and the weather is typically more settled although again variation even between the hours now in terms of that that's those changes it is really important for us to know the environment so this is why whenever we ask people to report their sightings it's also really important to record the conditions when you're spotting how was the visibility what was the sea conditions was it flat calm or were there white caps because all of this data is then used during analysis to actually try and work out how likely it was to see an animal and therefore the rate of potential missing out species too. So there's a lot that kind of goes into trying to figure out um, what the data is showing. And actually the kind of gold standard of community sightings data for marine wildlife is effort based, effort related sightings data. So this is where basically we record how long or how far you travel to watch and time actually significantly influences the data. If you think about it, the longer you watch, 
the more likely you are to probably see something. And so by recording how long you watch for, we can then start to actually build that into the analysis and more accurately understand kind of how many animals there are and the places that they're found. We can also start to learn where animals aren't. So if you record your data and your, your effort and you record that you've sat on a headland for an hour and you haven't seen anything, that's actually still really important for us to know because that shows that that area has been monitored and there weren't animals there. So every single thing kind of builds up another layer which adds to our understanding. And so if we have a quick look at kind of a very simplistic um, way of talking about abundance and relative abundance, the top line is showing boat-based sightings. And actually, if you have a look at that, it looks like the area on the right potentially has more dolphins than the area on the left. However, if you factor in how far the boat has traveled or how long the person has watched, it's not actually that kind of as it first seems. So here, the boat travels two kilometers and sees one dolphin. The boat on the right travels six kilometers and sees three dolphins. So they're still seeing one dolphin per kilometer traveled. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So it's the same with land-based watching. So how can, you, how can you carry out this kind of gold standard of, of data collection? Well, you can track your excursions. If you're ever traveling on a boat, whether that be a ferry or whether that be on your own boat, or even if you're out with a whale watching operator and potentially they maybe don't collect the data, then you can take part. Um, it's really easy. And what the app does is it tracks the distance and the speed that you go at and creates track lines. Um, the other way is from land to carry out an effort based watch where you record. Typically for us, we use Sea Watch Foundation protocols, which means that you record the conditions and how long you're watching for kind of every 15 minutes. Um, and you tend to watch for at least an hour. So there are lots of ways to get involved. And if you are interested in doing this, then please do consider it because it really adds that extra layer into the data, which gives us so much more opportunity to learn about these animals. However, it's not always possible to carry out land-based watching and you may not always want to sit on a headland for an hour. And so that's where kind of casual opportunistic sightings where you may be just walking along and something catches your eye is still really important. An example of how this can help us learn about them is the first and last sightings of each of the species every year. So in April time in the Hebrides, we tend to get reports of the first minke whale arriving and then kind of the first basking shark, which with basking sharks, they tend to arrive and then they disappear again. And then we get much more uh, kind of concentrated sightings of them in July and August, so around now. So this kind of data is helping us to know when the animals are in our waters and how long they're staying for. And we can then compare that as well between years. It's also about looking at the anomalies. So with the common dolphins, for example, uh, those common dolphins staying in the winter time up kind of near Ullapool, that's an anomaly. And actually, if that then starts to happen every year, then it's starting to build a picture of changes that are happening in the marine environment. So moving on to place. Uh, so here, this is a screenshot from Whale Track app of sightings taken in the, or sightings recorded in the last week. Um, so just one week of sightings shown there. I couldn't show any more because you couldn't really see the land. Um, so in that space of a week, we've got amazing diversity, firstly, uh, of species seen, which we kind of briefly mentioned later. And also we get to see where the animals are spotted. Um, so with eyes on the water, we're getting a really good picture of what's going on across a much wider geographical area than we could cover, say, on our research vessel alone. The other thing is that it shows us uh, in terms of the kind of habitat use as well, because you can then start to look at those areas and the depth of the seabirds um, and, uh, you know, the food that's in that area. So we, we get a much better understanding of why the animals are here and what's important for them, which then allows better protection and kind of conservation measures. 
Um, so yeah, here we're showing actually the common dolphins that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see actually there's quite a lot of common dolphins seen up in the kind of northern area. And that really is a change. It's a change in location and it's a change over time. Um, so when we first started recording common dolphins and getting records in from the public in 1990 and early 2000s, common dolphins weren't actually that common in Scotland at all. And they definitely weren't really seen up in the kind of north, northwest area. Over time, in the last 15 years or so, they have shifted their distribution. And again, they're seen um, in bigger numbers and for longer periods of time. So it's showing a real change. And that is really known thanks to Silurian data, but also community, community sightings. And, and why is this? Well, it's very hard to say cause and effect uh, in the marine environment. However, we do think that it is linked to our seas warming. And as temperatures have increased uh, and the waters have become warmer, these warm water species have actually been able to extend their range. And the impact of that on other species like colder water dolphins is still to be seen. So it shows the need for that long-term kind of continuous monitoring. So you might be quite surprised to realize that actually almost 30% of sightings through whale track have been recorded from land. A lot of people kind of think you have to go out on a boat to see whales and dolphins, and it's absolutely not the case. Uh, right across the whole of the UK, it is possible to see whales, dolphins, porpoises, basking sharks, turtles, sunfish from land. Um, it does take patience. You usually need binoculars and kind of getting, getting your eye in and getting used to what you're spotting for definitely helps. Um, so if you're, if you're kind of new to it, trying to get on a training course is really beneficial. But on the west coast of Scotland, to try and help people and encourage land-based watching, we helped create the Whale Trail, which is a network of over 30 sites. It's a community-based initiative, really linking people with place in terms of places to go to spot animals, but also cultural and heritage links to these animals. The other thing is that land-based watching is actually a great way to see these animals with minimal impact. So it reduces the number of boats on the water. It means that there's not a need to get close to the animals. Um, and actually, therefore, it makes it, it really reduces the chance of any kind of unintentional disturbance. Um, so I really would recommend it. Watching from the ferries, again, they're a great platform um, if you are trying to spot animals. So we can learn a lot about coastal species. Bottlenose dolphins come within meters of the shore. They're very comfortable in shallow water and being quite sizable, kind of up to four meters in length. Um, if you've got a calm day, you can have fantastic sightings where you can hear them as they come up to breathe and you can kind of see them. And they're often quite acrobatic as well at times. Um, photographs and videos are really valuable. So from these, we can do some kind of dolphin detective work. We are able to match individual animals and then start to track their movements. And actually using these techniques, HWT learned from community data that there are two different groups of bottlenose dolphins on the west coast of Scotland. There are the inner Hebridean pod that tend to be seen around the inner Hebrides, and this is around 30 to 40 animals. And then there is an outer Hebridean pod that tend to be seen around Barra. So that sounds, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's, it's amazing to learn this. As well as that, then there are offshores as well. So there are different groups again. And actually a lot of what we've learned about these animals has only really come about in the last 20 to 30 years. It wasn't until 2006 that actually HWT were the first people to say bottlenose dolphins were resident on the west coast of Scotland. So when we're studying animals in the marine environment where we only get glimpses of them as they come up to the surface, there are a number of things that you would have thought would be kind of a given um, that we're still trying to figure out. And a, another great example of this is minke whales. So minke whales come in the summertime but actually where they go in the winter is still 
completely unknown. Um, and so we're still waiting for matches and photographs to be able to figure that, that mystery out. So tracking movement happens kind of locally, like the bottlenose dolphins, knowing there's two groups within the west coast of Scotland, but also within the whole of the UK, and then within kind of more of a global context too. Another great example of this is the killer whales. So some of you may know this individual. This is a male killer whale belonging to the West Coast community that are seen regularly on the West Coast of Scotland. And his name is actually John Coe. Now, John Coe has made the headlines a number of times, including a few times this year already, um, because he is so distinctive. He's got this huge notch out of his fin that is recognizable even from kind of real, really quite far away. And you can see that in the, uh, in the map, those red dots are sightings of John Coe, which have been confirmed with photographs since 1980. So he's an old animal um, reaching potentially the end of his lifespan. Um, but most sightings kind of based on the West Coast, that actually, this, this is, I mean, it's incredible because to show how one photograph can have, a, have a, such an impact because actually what happened in May was that a photograph was taken of this animal, John Coe, down in Cornwall. And this was kind of mind boggling for us because although it's likely that John Coe's range extended into England, this is actually the first ever report of this killer whale since 1980 ever being seen in English waters, let alone as far down south as Cornwall. Um, so we can learn about these animals' ranges just from single photos here and there. And he's actually recently been over on the east coast of Scotland. Uh, he was seen by swimmers crossing the channel down towards Dover. So he's been kind of making the rounds this year already, keeping us on our toes. Um, but it's a great, great example of, of what we can learn. Moving on then to biodiversity, I've already kind of hinted at this. Um, and actually, Scotland and England are amazing for whales and dolphins. When I first started here at the Trust kind of seven years ago, I didn't even know we had whales and dolphins in our waters. Um, and to find out that actually we've got a quarter of all species in the world recorded here is incredible. Now, don't get too excited. Some of these have only been seen once and some of these have been seen dead. Um, that's the way that scientists make lists. Uh, so there's a list of all species recorded and that's 24. Now through whale track, 16 different species of marine megafauna have been recorded. Um, so that's including things like turtles and sunfish and eight cetaceans I would say are regularly seen. This map here is actually showing diversity. Um, so the areas in red are showing highest diversity in terms of number of species. Um, and that is actually, that's all effort corrected for how long that's been watched, but it's from uh, Silurian, our research vessel, rather than community data. But communities, as well as things like killer whales, we can learn about rare sightings of animals where they turn up once or twice and then they disappear again. And if it wasn't for you guys out looking, we just wouldn't know that they are there. Um, in this new digital era, community data is getting better and better. And with smartphones and people having even better cameras, the photos and videos are allowing us to validate the sightings as well and know for certain. And sometimes cross-reference, you know, it's it, the scientists kind of running between organizations online, checking, uh, checking species ID, and um, there's lots going on behind the scenes. But it's not just the scientists that are doing this, it's the communities and the people online as well. People that are wildlife enthusiasts, local naturalists, guides, photographers, all working together on places like Facebook to, to learn about the animals. So a great example of this is humpback whales. A humpback whale was seen uh, off Col last year around this kind of time. And then over the winter time was then seen on the east coast and nicknamed Barney because he had a barnacle on his uh, dorsal fin. And Barney uh, made this kind of movement across Scotland and around Scotland and was matched by 
uh, Lindsay from Scot Scottish Humpback Whale uh, Facebook group. Um, and she was then able to say, actually, yes, this is the same whale. Uh, she compared the tails and uh, that then contributed to our understanding. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a kind of team effort, um, definitely a team effort. And yeah, it's only getting better and better. So now is a great time to get involved. So populations then, um, learning about animals and, and groups within species, um, talking more about killer whales. Uh, I think a lot of the examples I'm giving now are based around photographs and the sightings that go along with these. So photo identification basically is where we use photographs of individual animals um, and we can identify them by their marks and scars on their body or fin. Um, it's fantastic because it's non-invasive. Uh, we don't need to put any tags on the animals or get close to them. We can use long lenses on cameras um, and really just allow the animals to come to us, um, but, but be able to track them. So here are the fin profiles of the West Coast community of killer whales that are typically seen around, around the West Coast of Scotland. And um, you can see there's, there's quite a variation. John Coe's definitely the most noticeable and kind of recognizable with the notch, um, but the others also have slight differences between their fins and um, their saddle patches as well. So it's what it's doing is allowing us to then start to kind of get a better understanding of their lives, like who is hanging out with who and you know try to work out the social associations between individuals as well. But these groups don't mix. So the West Coast group is a unique and isolated group, but there are other killer whales in, Scot in Scottish and UK waters. A great example of this are the Northern Isles community of killer whales that maybe on first look, look very similar, but actually as you get to know them, um, they are in fact quite different. They look different, they're smaller, they've got different shape eye patches, um, and they tend to stick around Shetland, um, but do move around between Shetland, Orkney, and kind of uh, North, North Scotland. Um, so different groups within species is, yeah, it's really growing our understanding. And, um, this, the Northern Isles group is thought to potentially be, it's kind of semi-resident, so mostly seen around Shetland, like I said, but not really moving between countries, whereas then there are other killer whales that move kind of between Iceland as well. Um, these guys totally confused us all when they turned up in the Clyde. Um, so this was back in 2018 now, and we got reports of killer whales down in the Clyde near Glasgow. Really strange. I mean, in, in the time that we've been recording these animals, there have only been a handful of killer whales seen in the Clyde. Um, and so to find out that a group that are normally around Shetland had made that whole journey, again, it just shows you there's, there's so much that we don't know. And every single photograph really helps just add that little piece to the puzzle. Um, this is a mystery pod that was seen and we still don't even know these, these animals. Um, so it's not just, yeah, the, the data's not written yet. There's, there's things that are being added. There's new animals getting added to catalogues all of the time um, as we have births and also deaths. Um, so with photographs being able to then compare animals, we can start to work out who is alive and who has been deceased. And I think this kind of links in with the really sad stranding of Lulu, um, a, an animal within this West Coast group that died in 2016. Um, so she unfortunately died due to human impacts. Um, PCBs are a chemical that had built up in her system. So she was very heavily polluted and had toxic levels, um, which is incredibly sad, but also important because it's the first record of this um, and to be able to learn this to then know about threats to other animals is very important. So it's also their behaviour as well that we can learn. Every time you fill out a sighting and you have to write what the animals are doing, that tells us information. We can start to look at which animals are returning to certain areas year after year. Um, so we know that minke whales 
are faithful to sites in Scotland and they come back each year. This is Nobble, a classic example of a whale that we all love around here, uh, with the Nobble on the end of the fin, who has now been seen over 50 times in these waters and has re returned for 15 years in a row now. And why? Well, to feed. Scotland has got great food for minke whales and all the other animals we've talked about today. And actually, you know, it's important to recognise that this is what they're doing because that then helps again to like feed in to conservation. Um, so here we've got a minke whale, believe it or not, that's actually the tail as the minke whale lunges kind of and has gone in sideways to get a huge amount of fish. Um, and they only do this when prey is highly concentrated. So if you report a minke whale that's lunge fed, that's giving us some idea of what's happening in the marine environment. And we can look at, for example, how many minkies lunge feed over time and, and, and start to really get a picture of what's going on under the water. Another great example of behavior that we can learn about is basking sharks. These are basking sharks. There's two sharks here with the triangular fin. And then the second triangle, that's its tail. Then we've got another fin and then another tail. So they're both swimming along together in a line. And this is thought to potentially be a courtship behavior, although we're still trying to figure this out along with other researchers. Um, so it shows that they're here for important key life history stages. And that data helps to make sure that they're protected. It's gone into marine protected areas and in terms of actually helping to designate them, which thankfully they were designated uh, in December last year. So we now have the first ever marine protected area for basking sharks in the whole of the world here on the West Coast. And that's a huge part thanks to community data and photographs. Um, so it's trying to learn more about them and, and kind of things that maybe on first glance would look hidden. Here's, this is a Risso's dolphin with plastic around its fin that we encountered when we were out on, on Silurian. But other people send in pictures of whales with parasites or dolphins with skin lesions. Some of this is normal and other things are man-made or threats. Um, and to be able to look at the photographs and try to work out kind of the incidence of this, how many people, how many animals this is happening to, then again gives us a kind of understanding of what's going on. So we've got potentially a dolphin here that has come into contact with a propeller or some other type of injury. Thankfully, this this dolphin is is well and is alive and and still being seen. The bottom is a minke whale um, that actually has a box strap around its rostrum. Um, so with, we're learning more every day about entanglement threats um, and other threats like plastic that we can then use to try and try and mitigate against it and, and come up with solutions. I think it's about finding solutions and working with communities to get those. And then finally, strandings. Um, well, while whale track is not a strandings app and there are apps out there that do that, we do hear about animals showing kind of unusual behavior, shall we say, um, which can be a helpful tool kind of cross working um, to then actually encourage people to get out and, 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 and be there before a stranding happens. So getting marine mammal medics that are trained to the scene to be able to actually help. And, um, you know, in this case, it was pilot whales. Um, with pilot whales, they were able to refloat a number of animals before any harm had come to them on the beach because um, because we were aware so quickly. So your sightings are building long term data wherever you're reporting. Um, they're improving knowledge about these animals that we can see clearly don't just live in one place. They are moving around and that's within the UK and within kind of a global context. They then inform decision making and we put a lot of effort into kind of working with policymakers in Scot in Scotland, but also our data then in informs kind of UK um, management as well. And that then means that they're getting better protection um, and kind of more effective management. So 
ways in which you can get involved are please do report your sightings. Hopefully that's been clear from my talk. Uh, there are a number of different people depending on where you are. If you're on the west coast of Scotland, please report to us. Um, around, rest, around the rest of the UK, Sea uh, Watch Foundation and Ireland is IWDG. If you're going out with a boat operator, try to look for operators that are WISE accredited. Uh, this shows that their skippers have undergone training in how to be responsible around wildlife, which then reduces the chance of any disturbance. And if you're actually going out on your own and on your own vessel, um, we've got some great tips for wildlife encounters on our website. And we can also send you the link for the Scottish Marine Wildlife Watching Code, which is fantastic. And I would really recommend, even if you're in the UK, to read it because it's full of like best practice and practical advice on how to how to watch wildlife without accidentally causing any harm. And then strandings as well. Please do report these, whether you see an animal in distress or unfortunately deceased. Um, we can learn a lot. Also, I've been talking about photos, so please do send them in um, and carry out effort based watches uh, if you can. It's not always possible, but a great time to do it is now. It's National Whale and Dolphin Watch starting this Saturday. It runs for a week and it's an absolutely great time to get out and watch the sea, even if it's just for an hour. Wherever you are in the whole of the UK, you can take part and it really contributes to a snapshot of marine life across the UK. So check out Sea Watch Foundation's website for more information. And I'm running a training course tomorrow that's free on how to carry out effort-based land watching and boat-based watching on the West Coast if you would like to take part. Um, so please get in touch with me, that's tomorrow evening. Uh, and that is all, does anybody have any questions? Perfect. Thank you so much, Pippa. What an amazing talk and what an incredible thing that you guys are doing up there. Um, so we'll go to Charles. I see you have your hand up. So we'll go to you first and then we've got a couple of questions from the chat as well. Uh, Pippa, hi. That was great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'd had I, actually I had a couple of questions, so I won't hog them, but I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll ask one of them and I'll come back to the other if there's time later. Um, I uh, I'm usually a sort of a single operator on a boat and do my um, my uh, recordings from a boat. Um, so as a result, I don't use the excursion tracker and it sounded as if it was quite important to do that because it's because I can't, you see what I mean, if I'm handling the boat, I can't, I can't do the, I can't report the sighting at the same time. Does that matter? Do you still do the excursion and then report the sighting later? Would you prefer that to happen or do I just stick with doing what I'm doing, which is basically reporting sightings when I get back in? Yeah, that's a good question. I will check with Lauren, who developed the app, if we can add sightings to an effort-based track. Um, because I'm not actually sure. I know that you can definitely change sightings and add things when you get back in. It's just whether you can add them to the track. So I will I will speak to Lauren about that and double check. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, it is really, really important. The other thing that it would ask you to do when you're collecting effort-based data is to record the environment. Um, and it actually will prompt you to do that. I think it's every half an hour um, because on Silurian it's, it's more frequent than that, but um, we reduced it to try and make it as easy as we could. Um, so yeah, but one of the ways that you can do that is if you notice the change in environment, then you can then mark that. So say you come across a fog, uh, a fog bank, you could then log that in. Um, but yeah, I'll find out that for you, Charles, um, and I'll get back to you. Smashing, thank you. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions from the chat. So the first one, um, we've got someone who actually sponsors the West Coast Willow Killer Whales with you guys. And she would like to know what your favorite whale and dolphin is that you've seen and where you saw it. Oh, um, my favorite whale and dolphin. I think, you know, it probably does have to be Jonko. Um, yeah, I think my first ever sighting of Jonko was actually out on a whale watching boat and we happened to have a, a film crew on board. Um, and so they filmed, they were filming the um, people's reaction to killer whales and, you know, like half of us were in tears and there was just so much emotion seeing him. And it was just incredible to see this animal that I had talked and taught thousands of children about 
um, and just hear the blow and they're just so, so impressive. Um, so John Co definitely has kind of a special place in, in my heart. Um, but I, I, I always get really excited to see Risso's dolphins as well. Um, because they just look so cool and uh, I don't get to see them that often. So yeah, Risso's are uh, again, another, another favorite. And another question from the chat. Would there be any way to safely remove the strap that was on that minky whale's rostrum? Good question. Um, I think it depends. That one unfortunately was very close to the whale's mouth. We're very lucky in Scotland actually to have an amazing team who are trained up to, they're called the Large Whale Disentanglement Team. Um, they've actually been abroad to get training on how to disentangle a whale and they can mobilize pretty quickly. Um, so they, that whale, that photo was taken many years ago before we had this team, but actually having a team trained means that there have been cases where whales have been entangled and reported through whale track actually by operators and, and the team's gone out and successfully uh, kind of freed the animal. So it depends on a case by case basis. Unfortunately for that one, I'm not sure it would be a good outcome. Box straps are nasty things. Like if you ever see a box strap, please just cut it because it will, it, you know, it could save an animal's life with just a single snip. Um, so yeah. Uh, hopefully that answers the question, but um, yeah, it, it's a it's a better. We're in a better situation now with the disentanglement team and people being aware of it as well, and not afraid to report that and then get some help to try and to do that. But it's also I would like to say it is very dangerous. Um, so we would always say to get in touch with BDMLR um, and the kind of correct organisations because people have lost their lives trying to save whales. Um, so it really is important to be left to the professionals. Yeah, and that kind of leads on to another question that we had of asking how much of a problem is plastic pollution um, for these animals up in the Hebrides, such as bags, bottles and fishing gear? Yeah, good question. Um, and something that we're still really trying to kind of figure this one out. Um, we record sightings of rubbish from Salarian and certainly a large proportion of what we report is plastic. Um, so we're seeing bottles, plastic, um, and also kind of lost fishing gear. Um, in terms of the impact on whales and dolphins, it's, it's quite hard to tell. From our data, we can look at how many animals have scars and have survived. Um, so we can look at kind of the survival rates. Um, we don't see it that often, and that was actually, I think, one of the only times that Risso's dolphin with plastic that I've seen it personally. Um, but also that working with the Strandings team, it's interesting from them that actually to hear that the animals that are most impacted are the deep diving species, but they're also the species that we see the least. Um, and you can't really tell that they're suffering until it's too late. Um, and that is it's a similar story with the jellyfish. Um, and the turtles where they get that the food mistaken. Um, so deep diving species are using sound to hunt in darkness and therefore getting kind of mis kind of accidentally ingesting it. But yeah, it's it's difficult. It's difficult to kind of gauge. I think entanglement, unfortunately, is is probably a larger issue for the animals that we're seeing more frequently than um, and in discarded or even active fishing gear, which is real shame, um, rather than plastic. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a problem, I think, for lots of marine mammals out there. Yeah. Um, so another question. Um, so someone asked, is it extremely rare to spot whales and sharks from the west coast of Wales? I don't know if that might be something you do know. Um, so I was wondering if they have a chance of spotting anything in West Wales. Yeah, yeah, there is there is chance to see um, sea animals in Wales for sure. Like even the killer whales have been seen off uh, like Pembrokeshire and places like that. So definitely have a look at Sea Watch Foundation's website. Um, they have a map of all the sightings, and you can go in and kind of interact with that and find out more. Um, but yes, definitely um, there there are especially some of the species like bottlenose dolphins, uh, harbour porpoise, minky, minky whale are seen right around the coastline across the whole of the UK. Yeah, I mean, 
South, uh, west coast of Wales just had a visitor of the walrus, didn't they? So lots of marine mammals in that yeah. area for them. Um, so it, with regards to marine protection areas, someone would like to know, how is that protection ensured? Is If there was a threat presence such as a dredger, what would be done to remove that from the area? Good question. And at this point, I can't tell you because the marine protected areas in on the west coast of Scotland anyway, or in Scotland, at this present time, it's only the area that has been designated. The management measures within those areas are still TBC, and that will involve a public consultation where people from kind of all walks of life, all backgrounds can take part and have their say. Um, so how those areas are protected is still, is still to be seen. Um, there will be a, yeah, there will be a consultation and we tend to try and share that um, and we will feed into that. Um, so yeah, at this point, I'm not sure. Um, hopefully yeah. something, I think yes. the main answer. Yeah, yeah hopefully something yeah. will be done. Um, so obviously a lot of your talk, this is a question from myself actually, a lot of your talk is about taking photographs now and photographs are obviously such an amazing way to help organisations such as yourself and many other people identify individuals. Do you have any tips for taking the best photographs for identification? Yeah, um, so I think photographs are getting better and better, which is, is, is really awesome. Um, for photo identification, it's usually the whales and dolphins dorsal fins that we're using. Um, so trying to get photographs of the animal like it is on the screen here, actually. Um, so if we can, where the animal is kind of uh, like horizontal to the camera, so you can get a really clear picture of, of the fin. Um, if it's at an angle, it's a bit harder because it then distorts any nicks or notches. Um, with minke whales and animals, some of the animals are less marked. So dolphins and bottlenose dolphins have, tend to have quite a lot of notches on the fins. Minkies are much harder. So even just photographs of the body can really help. Um, try to think about where the lighting is as well. So you want to try and have the sun behind you so that it's not, you're not taking a photograph of the animal in shadow. It's well lit. And that then allows us to kind of zoom in and look at close, more closely at the detail. And the other thing is that we're naturally inclined to take photographs of the most recognizable animal in the group. So where possible, try to take pictures of the whole group as well, because that can show how many animals there are, but also will help you to kind of focus in on other animals that maybe don't look so distinctive. Um, that's one of the things with John Co. Everybody always takes pictures of John Co. And so it's like, OK, well, we have a lot less photographs of the females um, and partly that will have been in the past because he was just so impressive. Um, so uh, one final thing I would like to say is a lot of the photographs that are in our presentation have been taken under license. So we have got a license from Nature Scott to go up close to these animals um, and actually kind of um, spend longer with them as well. So if you're following the marine wildlife watching codes, then you really shouldn't be approaching these animals closer than 100 meters and you should be slowing down. So any photos you do get are when the animals have chosen to come to you or you've got a very long lens, which is always a nice bonus, but costs a lot of money. So, um, yeah, just make sure that the animals are the ones that are kind of in charge of the encounter, I suppose. And if they want to move away, let them tips um so i can see two people have their hands up so we'll go to you libby first because i think your hand went up first um so if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question to pippa and then amy will come to you straight after so you said that there have been 24 different cetacean species spotted what were they oh that is Every a test. tricky question <laughs> um yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to give you all 24 right on the spot, um, unfortunately. I can find it out for you, and if you would like me to email it to you, I can. Um, some of them are pretty cool. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's some beaked whales in there, um, which are really quite unusual to see. Uh, we even have things like fin whale, which is the second largest whale in the world. 
that's been spotted in Scottish waters. Um, so yeah, there's a huge range. At one point there was a narwhal, um, but I think we had to discount the narwhal from Scotland anyway, because we didn't have quite enough scientific evidence. Um, so yeah, it's a whole range. And some of them, like I said, have just died and been seen on a beach um, once and they've then got the record. So quite a mixture, but yeah, I can let you know if you want, if you want to know, you'll find my email on the website and drop me a message and I will send you the list. Thank you for that Libby. So Amy, um, if you would like to unmute and ask your question to Pippa as well, you'll probably be the last question of today. Hi, yeah. Um, in relation to you saying about like variables in the encounters, like say the dolphins going through a fog bank, I'm from the Isle of Wight and we've had a lot of dolphins appearing in the past few years and the variables being, variables being that people have been encountering them more and like sort of going towards them with jet skis. So would we report incidents where that would happen, where it could like possibly change the animal's behavior and visiting of certain areas? Yeah, I think so. Um, there's a couple of things in here. One of them is that if, you, if you're carrying out effort-based watches, Sea Watch Foundation actually do have like a little section where you can record if the animal has been interacting with other uh, like boats and things. Um, and you could also add, add that on Whale Track in the app and write it in the comments. Um, so please, do, yeah, do report if you see things like that. The other thing is that if you are worried about animal, uh, people approaching animals and you're concerned that actually it is causing a change in the animal's behavior um, then it is definitely worth kind of making a record of that and actually getting in touch with the relevant people so where an animal has been disturbed where they've changed their behavior and it potentially has an impact that that animal then maybe wants to move away or is less likely to come to an envir environment that's important to um, try and prevent that from happening. And so there are a whole team of people within the police um, that are the uh, wildlife liaison officers that actually deal with wildlife crime. And um, while some of the things are actually, it's just more around people not understanding, um, it is important to try and record instances of this and actually who's involved. If you have any photographs or videos, you can send it into them um, and uh, yeah, actually try to kind of get some advice from them. Um, and if you, it depends on the situation and the people involved, um, but sometimes actually it is possible to have conversations with people and just say, actually, did you know that I think you, you know, the, these animals, um, maybe didn't quite enjoy that encounter. Because I think a lot of people just don't quite understand that. So obviously don't put yourself at risk. Um, but if you feel that you're on a kind of conversational level with people, um, talking about how the animals then maybe actually kind of need their space is can be really helpful too. Does that answer your question? It does, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. Um, we're probably going to have to leave it there because I think we have come to the end of um, the session. But I have just dropped in um, a link to Pippa's details on the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust website. So if you do have any questions that crop up, I'm sure Pippa is more than happy for you to contact her with your questions. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Pippa. What an incredible talk and what an incredible um, project that you guys have been working on helping obviously our much loved marine mammals. Um, yeah, so I will stop the recording. Excellent. Thank you all.